the fact that we have to wait nine more days for Wuthering Waves, or by the time this comes out as a video, a week more for Wuthering Waves makes me sick. Okay, but I found this dude's channel, I Am Rivenous. Uh, I've seen a couple of these dudes' videos, and he makes some pretty good shit. Put out a beginner guide, and I'll be real. I'm looking for anything to watch for Wuthering Waves, man. Because I'm actually going to sweat. I'm going to take this game seriously for as long as I can take this game seriously. I want to shred. I want to dominate. And the fact that this guy's channel is doing as good as it is. Look at this, man. 10,000 views, 10,000 views, 46,000 views, 40,000 views. Bro. Looks good. Wuthering Waves content credits are coming in full swing. And we'll see which one of them will be the first to cause drama. Because I can already tell for a game that's perceived as hardcore as it is, I can already tell that CCs are going to be at each other's throats. And I can't wait to cover it all. Hey, if you're a CC and you want to talk some shit about another content creator, please do. Make it a video. Then send me the video, man. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for an excuse to have people at each other's throats. Dude, Wuthering Waves and Genshin Impact and Honkai Star Rail all going to be throttling each other at the same time like your mom in a gangbang with two dicks in her hands. It's going to be nuts. A few of you have been asking me to make this video, so here we go. Here's why I trust this guy, because he has an accent. I like that. That being said, we're going to speed it up. Oh, let's take a deep dive into the combat systems of Wuthering Waves, and based okay. on that, we will then learn how to build teams. This will be... So here's how I'm going to build a team, okay? I'm going to get Calcharo, and I'm going to get Yin Lin, and then I'm going to get probably Tao Chi, because she has the biggest boobs, and then I'm just never going to get hit, and then I'm just going to perfect parry everything, I'm going to perfect dodge everything. And then I'm going to call it a day, and that's pretty much it, but what do you think, Mr. Guide Maker Man? Quite a long and in-depth video, so get yourself some your coffee, and let's get started. T, he says fuck you think I'm, I'm American? We drink soda pop. First up, let's talk about the very basics. Or even better, gamer subs. Each resonator can have exactly one weapon equipped. This weapon usually features some special effect, which ranges from a simple okay. attack increase by 4% to a slightly more complicated one, such as increases attack by 10% for 4 seconds after casting your resonance skill. This can stack up to two times. So, why- Yeah, but this weapon is for poor people, bro. Why wouldn't I just get the five-star weapon? Do I even talk about weapons? Well, Depending on your weapon's effect and stats, that might uh -huh. change how you actually play a character. But yep. we will Good. get back to this later. Same thing with Echoes. I will not dive too deep into Echoes, as I already have like three videos on that, which you can watch if you're interested. Okay. Alright, let me dive deep on Echoes real quick. Take the ones that match what your character does and put it on them. And then whichever move you like from the Echoes, use that one, because it looks the coolest. Right, because in this game, your relics actually do something that's what Echoes are. Right, so they're going to give you an on-use button to use. And here's the best thing. Uh, if you want to have fun, just equip the turtle. Equip the turtle and watch it dance around. And it's cool. And that's pretty much it. However, it is worth mentioning that many of the echo abilities can be swap cancelled, which in turn will vastly increase your DPS, as some of the echo abilities are actually quite long. Looking at you, monkey. To add to this... Yeah, but the monkey's cool as fuck. I'm going to use him regardless. Some resonators also have specific skill animation cancels, but that's an entirely different video. So, speaking of which, let's cover the resonators. Okay. They are what defines most of the gameplay after all. Each resonator has eight skills, well, technically seven. One of them is usually something like can produce special dishes when cooking. So let's say seven. Garbage. Two of them are inherent skills, which are passive bonus abilities. An example for this would be Yin Lin's pain immersion, which increases her crit rate for five seconds after casting her resonance skill. Spe yeah, people also don't know a lot about their forte buffs as well, because every character, I believe, has three innate skills, and then you also have what your echo can do, which gives you a fourth skill, and then also you have the charge uh, resonance bar, and then you also have intro and outro skills, and then you also have the way you have to play your forte, bro. Like, the character death is going to be so nice. Speaking of which, said resonance skill is a special ability with a unique effect and a medium cooldown. Usually, at least, some resonators have really short cooldowns on their skill. They also all have one basic attack, which defines the damage dealt by, well, your basic attacks, as well as your heavy attacks, yep. or in Genshin terms, charge attack, your dodge counter, which is basically a basic attack, which you can do directly after a perfect dodge, and your mid-air attack, which is literally... Okay, so a lot of people might think that this is very difficult to, like, understand, but it's really not, considering that League of Legends has four abilities and an auto attack. It's really going to be no different. Whether you attack quickly, or you attack slowly, or you attack in the air, or you attack after you dodge... You're still all pressing the same fucking button. It's still one button that does four different things depending on when you do it. It's really not going to be that hard. It's really just a plunge. Next up is the ultimate, or also called Resonance Liberation in this game. This is, well, the ultimate ability, which usually inherits quite a long cooldown and requires the character to have their Resonance Liberation energy fully charged. This is the first of three resources. I will get back to all of them after we have them covered. Then there's also the fourth circuit. The Fort Circuit is a gameplay-defining ability which is really hard to categorize since it totally changes depending on the character. To go back to Yin Lin as an example, her Forte basically allows her to deal damage while being off-field after a certain yep. condition has been fulfilled. 
However, nearly all resonators have one thing in common. The Ford Circuit requires to be charged and can only be used when the Ford Circuit energy, also called Ford Gauge, is fully filled. There's a lot of people who are looking at the resonance bar as a complete negative because this doesn't allow them to, to play the game the same as Genshin Impact. Whereas when you play Genshin Impact, you kind of just have your main DPS, you use your sub DOS, you press their ability, you press their alt, and you swap off. But for this game, you're going to be auto-attacking a lot or attacking a lot as the characters who aren't your main DPS. And some people see that as a downside, but I think that's going to make your side characters feel a lot more important and make your gameplay feel a lot more varied because you're going to have to adapt certain play styles unless you use Verena because Verena can just do whatever she wants. But I think it's going to make combat feel a lot more in-depth and a lot more satisfying, to be honest. And the characters that you want to use are going to be more than an ability and an ultimate. They're going to be used as like pretty much full-fledged characters. This is the second resource. Because I'll be real. Okay, let me think of an example. Do you even know what... Uh, do you do you even know what Kakomi's basic attack looks like? That's a bad example. Do you even know what Farina's... No, you know what Farina's is. Okay, well, there's some characters where you probably don't even know what their fucking auto-attacks look like in Genshin Impact just because you press EQ and then you swap off. You know what I'm saying? It'll be nice to be able to see their whole kit, right? What does Bennett's auto-attack look like? Oh, yeah, the same as every other sword character. But you get the point that I'm making. Again, back to that in a bit. The last abilities each Resonator has are their intro and outro skills. These are usually a special entrance ability, dealing damage, restoring health, or similar in the case of intro skills. And in the case of outro skills, they usually buff up the next character or the entire team or deal damage. Again, usually. Exceptions exist. The outro and intro skill can be used when the concerter energy of the current on-field character is full. Outro and intro skills are automatically activated when you switch a character God, the running when the looks so energy good. is full. You will also have this possibility indicated by a special sound effect. Oh, dude, can you imagine sound cues? Dude, that is so nice. Dude, you know what else would have been really nice? There was something that I was always begging for in Genshin Impact, which was, like, a timer on your abilities so you could see if their abilities are up when you swap. Because, like, for example, for characters like Fish, I want to know when her E is up, even when she's not on the field. So it would have been cool rather than saying, oh, her alt's up, but it's also, like... Is their E up as well? Would have been so nice. Dude, the, the, the audio cue is such a good step in the right direction because it doesn't clutter up the UI and it gives you that information that you need. Fuck, that's so nice. When switching out your current character, the outro skill of said character will be triggered as well as the intro skill of the incoming resonator. And, well, the concerto energy will be consumed. Now that we have covered all three types of resources, let's talk about them. The resonance liberation energy, or ultimate energy, is acquired by all means and can be acquired while being off-field because 30% of all ultimate energy generated will be shared to your teammates. However, this shared energy is not influenced by the energy ranking of your current resonator, but by the energy ranking of the receiving character. As an example, let's look at Rover. Rover's full basic attack sequence will generate 11.4 resonance liberation energy for themselves yep. and shares 3.42 energy to other resonators. However, this is only if your current energy ranking is exactly 100%. If you would increase this value to, let's say, 200%, Rover will now gain 22.8 energy, but still only shares 3.42 energy to your team. This also means that... Alright, for anybody who's getting stressed out by hearing those numbers, just understand, you don't need a spreadsheet to play these fucking games. It really ain't that deep, and I'll be real, the moment some guy starts talking about a spreadsheet, I turn my brain off. I hope none of you guys actually thought that shit was important, it's just not. It, it don't matter, man. Here's here's how you're going to play the game. You're going to press your buttons until your gauges fill up. And if you don't beat it, you're just going to grind a couple more echoes until you beat it. And then you're going to level up your characters until you can beat it. It ain't that deep. Energy reckon is more important for units, which are most of the time not on the field and are very reliant on the ultimate. Fort circuit energy, or the fort gauge, is also acquired by basically all means, but you are required to stay on the field. To cast Rover's Fort Circuit, you need 50 energy, and you can hold 100, which basically means up to two stacks. Yep. Hence, if your character is also very dependent on the Fort Circuit, and to be honest, most resonators are, you will need some significant field time with them, and adjust your rotations accordingly. Last but not least, we have the Concerto energy, which- I'm gonna left click and spam my buttons until everything dies. <laughs> and when I get attacked, I'm gonna press the dodge button. I ain't doing nothing else, bro. Also requires a resonator to be on the field to generate. Concerto caps out at 100, which means you need 100 Concerto energy to activate the outro skill of your current and the intro skill of the incoming character. In Rover's example, that would be 12 Concerto for the full basic attack sequence. Yep. Given they need 1 to 2 seconds for the full sequence, they would need 10 seconds spamming only their basic attack to get to full Concerto. That was a lot. And that all being said, let's cover the game's combat mechanics. First up, you will sometimes see an... 
but it's pretty much just how much auto attacks do characters need to be able to charge their intro and outro skills. And that's the time, right? It, it really ain't that deep. It's very simple to say, this character needs this amount of times of regular attack in order to charge their intro and outro. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to try to layman's everything that's said right now to make this shit very easily to understand. I don't, And I also know when information is presented as this hardcore and this confusing, it can deter a lot of people. But I want to ensure you, it's really not that difficult once different terminology is used. Enemies flashing golden, just like here. Pressing your basic attack just at the right time will not only inflict a significant amount of toughness damage to the enemy, 12.5% to be exact, but also completely cancels. Toughness damage is the bar underneath the health bar, and then once they're in a broken state, they stop moving and they also receive more damage. The attack. Toughness is, by the way, this little white bar below the enemy health, and depleting it will stun said enemy for a few seconds. This means 8 parries will fully deplete the toughness bar. However, when actually playing the game, all other actions such as basic attacks or skills will also damage it which means in a real fight this amount will be substantially lower. One last mention, while stunned, enemies will not take more damage, and toughness damage inflicted by your resonator's abilities will depend highly on the damage dealt by your attack. So, what do you do if you cannot parry an attack? Well, either you get hit... So it depends on what your definition of take more damage is, right? Because here's the thing. In World of Warcraft, when bosses go into a weakened state, bosses will take more damage because you have more of a time to be able to use your abilities and your auto attacks on a character that isn't able to move because then everything will be able to land. So they will take more damage just because now the player will have more active time in order to hit them. Or... But do they have a percent increase? Sh sure, maybe some don't. Better you dodge. Dodging at the perfect time will grant you a perfect dodge, which in turn will make you next directly the dodge following basic attack a dodge counter. Dodge counters are very powerful and deal a lot more damage, toughness damage, and generate a lot more resonance liberation and concerted energy than your usual basic attack. Looking again at Rover, the dodge counter itself generates 5.24 resonance liberation energy and 16.67 concerto energy. Again, Rover here is just an example. Energies generated will be different for each resonator and their respective skills and abilities. Last but not least, let's just very briefly touch on multiplayer. When playing multiplayer, it behaves very similar to Genshin. However, you basically get to only control one resonator at a time, and activating your intro or outro skills will instead buff the resonators of your friends or strangers you are playing with instead. Or Aside just do from that, damage. combat behaves as usual. Knowing all of this, we can now get into some more general stuff. To make full use of all the characters' that skills, they so will require sick. a good amount of field time. Most, if not all, resonators right now do indeed require quite some time on field, and until they do release a unit who does not, we will likely not see anyone swapping in a unit. So it said exception is Verena, let me explain what that is. So pretty much the way that Verena works is that she has an intro-outro skill, which gives you a buff that increases your team's damage by 20%, gives you a 20% damage bonus, right? She also has an attack buff as well. For most characters, the way that you trigger that is by going on field, doing attacks, and then swapping off. But for Verena, it's just if you use your ability three times, then you'll have that intro outro skill available to, for you to use. So people who really want to emulate the Genshin Impact gameplay style on Wuthering Waves can use characters by Verena. As much as I really don't like Verena, and as much as I am quote unquote anti Genshin Impact, I'm more like anti Genshin Impact game state. I see no nothing wrong if you want to emulate Genshin style for a more casual experience for all players to pull a fucking Verena because she will make the game significantly easier and she will make the combat self feel a lot more familiar to Genshin players and there's even Nahida. She's fucking Nahida, bro. So I recommend any new casual player pull of Verena, but me personally, I, I, I just hate her design so much. I hate her design. And I also, I, I want the combat to feel different so I'm intentionally not pulling her because I, I want to feel like I'm playing a different game. But uh, yeah, Verena mimics the Genshin style very, very, very satisfactory. Unit casting the ultimate and swapping out again. So how do other supports work, right? So other supports are going to work by using their skill and then using their ultimate and then using their attacks X amount of times in order to fully charge their resonance bar. And then when you swap off of them an ability or swap into them an ability is going to play that heals or buffs or does damage to the enemies. It's pretty much how it's going to work. So auto attacks are going to be strung in a lot more into the combat. Also, this is inherently due to the concerto mechanic and how it currently works. Some characters are also simply better played solo. Oh, little addendum. Everything is subject to change until the game's launch. Just put that out there. Then with the team. Dan Jin is such an example. And that would... Like Don Jin, for example, was used as a lot of people's shining example that forced our DPS are really broken, but I've heard that she's going to be nerfed before release. It would probably literally be everything you need to know about combat. Which also means we can now start finally with team building. So each team consists up to three resonators. But again, sometimes specific units might just be better played solo, so don't be surprised when you see many dungeon solo players. Oh, wait. 
These teams will consist of one or two damage dealers, and one or two supports. For this section, I want to briefly mention, please play who you like first and foremost. Absolutely. Going by the meta or specific good teams is always secondary. Always glad when content creators put this information out. One million percent. It doesn't matter who... You can play whoever the fuck you want, but if you're not enjoying the game that you're playing because of the character you're playing, then stop playing them. It doesn't matter how much better they make it. In any case, if you play one or two damage dealers, that will... Having fun always takes priority over anything else. It'll depend highly on units which synergize well with each other. As I mentioned before, most units will take significant time on the field to make full use of their kits. Some, actually many of the characters, have an ultra skill which buffs one or more units on the field. I actually think that Sidney Marr has had a great take on this. So here, go check him out and sub to him if for whatever reason you have not done so yet. Okay. But I will also be free and steal his namings and his take. Also, really good to see Wuthering Waves content creators already shouting each other out and helping each other out because there was barely any of that in the Genshin community. There was a lot of that in the Honkai Star Rail community. And that's why I believe the Honkai Star Rail Genshin, uh, or the, the Honkai Star Rail CC space is a lot more cohesive than the Genshin space. It was fragmented. It's fragmented as shit. Like, it's legit. It's fragmented as shit. How often do you see collabs in the Genshin community? Fucking never. They're such an oddity. It's ridiculous. Take right here. So, for resonators who have buffing capabilities, we can separate them into two groups. Direct buffers and indirect buffers. Direct buffers are units which will only buff the next incoming unit on the field, and indirect buffers are those who can buff the entire team. Yep. This is also where the Echo Set Rejuvenating Glow comes in, as its 5 piece bonus increases the entire team's attack by 15% for 30 seconds. These it's really good. It's gonna be best or team buffers for a lot of, for a lot of team more or less limited to supports, which as of right now, uh, best meaning best in slot, meaning the the the, the relic set that you're gonna want to run on a lot of people, so you want to get to farm in that shit, kind of like Noblesse Oblige in Genshin Impact or the Traveler Speedster set in Honkai Star Rail. ...is actually only Verena. Even Baiji only buffs one single character. Yeah. But again, the healing set also allows Baiji to take that role, so yep. that is great. Direct buffers are, at least for now, most secondary DPS units. This would include all these units on screen right now, and if you refer to those as sub-DPS or not, I will leave that to you. But some It's gonna feel way different than Genshin's experience when you realize how much time every character is going to need on the field. It's gonna be really fucking nice. Of them, like Yanlin, take significantly more field time than a sub DPS would like, at least in the traditional sense. Also, they often deal damage equal to your main DPS, so there's that as well. Now that we know the basics, let's have a look on how we can build a team. First, we do want to select the resonator we love the most and certainly want to play with. Or just the one you have, or you are a meta slave, so we will just take Yanlin. What a coincidence, I do like Yanlin as well, so let's yep. take her as an example. If you have not been living under a rock for the last month, you certainly have heard that Kalchado works very well with Yinlin. Yep. This is because Yinlin does have off-field damage capabilities and also provides a direct buff to Kalchado. Uh, the direct buff to Kalchado is that she buffs lightning damage and they're both lightning characters. A great support for that team would be Verena, for example, but that is mostly because she is really good and we currently have a- Verena's really good on everybody because she gives a universal attack buff and a universal damage buff. Significant lack of good supports. Hence, Baiji is also a good choice as of right now. Baiji's very good, but she's a lot slower than Verena. If you want, if you like Verena, use her, but Baiji will still be a very capable support, but she's just going to be a lot slower. Yang Yang and Mortify exist as well, but Mortify is a good support for heavy attacks, and Yin Lin does not a lot of heavy attacks, yep. and Yang Yang is mostly a grouper. But with Yin Lin in the team... Characters in this game are going to get better with time, and a lot of characters are going to get a lot worse with time. I think Verena is going to get Powercraft 100%, and then I think some of the more underwhelming characters are going to have characters released for their playstyle, and I think they're going to get a lot stronger, kind of for like Honkai Star Rail. But I, I, I am a firm believer that Verena is getting uh, Powercraft very quickly. Team, we do not really like I have no proof of that. So given our team of Yen Lin, Shadow, and Verena, we would start the fight with Verena, as she provides the longest lasting buffs with 30 seconds. Next up is Yen Lin, and from Yen Lin we can go into Kalchado. Then back to Yen Lin, and back again to Kalchado. The reason why I don't think Kalchado and Yen Lin will be powercraft in their direct state is due to the fact that they are very niche, which means these are the lightning characters. They are going to deal the lightning damage. They're very specific, right? And very specific characters generally don't get powercraft. Right, whereas very vague, generalized characters get power crept very quickly. This is just a hunch. I cannot prove anything. But like, you're not gonna power creep the lightning team anytime soon. Now you might make another team that's stronger of it with a different element, but they're not gonna be lightning, right? And PGR power creep took one and a half years. Great. I will show you the swap rotation of Yin Yin and Kadal Shadow on screen, but please keep in mind that this game is very reactive. Bosses are very aggressive, and you will need to dodge and cast dodge counters instead sometimes. It will not be possible in most situations to just follow a perfect rotation. And that's why a lot of the theory crafting for this game is straight up wrong. 
because people are giving you the ideal DPS scenarios that you're really not going to find yourself with. A lot of confusion for this game comes from a character. Uh, what's the name of Ying Yang Big Booby Girl Chat? Do we know her name? There's a character who looks like the Ying Yang symbol has really big tits. Uh, yeah, John Jin. And people were saying that John Jin was going to be very good because she can heal, she can shield, do tons of damage, yada, yada, yada. But what they're not telling you is, is how you have to do that and what she can do. Sure, she has the ability to do that stuff, but it takes her so fucking long and she needs to channel and like in a real fight, that's just not going to be possible. And that's why the theory crafting scene for Wuthering Wave is going to be so controversial is because what is idealistic versus what is realistic and finding that balance is going to be very difficult. And then people are going to say, yes, but they could do this. And then people are going to say, okay, show me how. And they're going to show you these damage on dummies. It's kind of like dummy numbers versus boss numbers. Oh, uh, that's why the game is so exciting because the bosses are actually going to fucking fight you and you're going to try to fuck it. You're going to have to move and dodge and play the fucking game. It's so good. And that's basically it. I know this has been a lot, so let's do a small recap. I also may add- I will say I'm fucking miserable that Yinlin's not available on launch. She's three weeks after launch, but that does give me something to look forward to. And I'm gonna be grinding the fuck out of summons, cause I need my girl. One or another useful tip here as well. First, make sure your supports and resonators, which are dependent on the ultimate, have enough energy regeneration to be able to sustain without much field time and gaining enough energy over the course of the field time from your two other resonators. How much energy regen that exactly is will depend vitally on all three resonators used as well as their weapon. Use the rejuvenating glow set on your indirect buffers and yep. either the moonlit cloud set or an attribute damage set on your direct buffers, depending on how much damage they actually contribute to the team. If they mostly provide buffs to your main DPS, go for moonlit clouds. If they can compete with your main DPS, prefer a damage focused set. Regarding rotations, they are a complicated matter so I will simplify it again. That does not mean it will apply to all teams. So the reason why it goes, the reason why the skill order is very important is because team buffer will buff everybody. And then direct buffer, the way that direct buffer works, it says the next person you swap into gets this buff, right? So you buff everybody, there's no conditional. And then you do the conditional buff. The conditional buff is whoever's next gets the buff. And then you go to that DPS, so you get the first buff, the conditional buff, and then you play the game. So that's the reason why it's put that way. Teams. But still, you usually want to start with your indirect team buffer as their buffs usually last for around 20 to 30 seconds, then switch into your direct buffer whose buff will last for around 14 seconds and finish off the rotation with your primary DPS. So what's the ideal team on launch? Really depends on what you pull for this account. The problem with giving the ideal team and stating the ideal team is that that's gonna make people feel that their teams aren't good enough because they don't have that ideal team. The ideal team is whatever characters you fucking have. And that's it. You make the best out of them. It's a case-by-case -case scenario. If you need help on launch, I'm going to be real. I'm going to become so well-versed in this game, it's fucking ridiculous. Because this really feels like a game I can sink my teeth into. And I can't wait. And plus, I'm going to be having multiple theory crafters and content creators and guide makers on my call pretty much the entire fucking stream. It's going to be great. Since all buffs will always scale with the sets your DPS already has, prioritize building your DPS first and foremost. Is the five-star selector guaranteed on launch? Uh, I believe so. However, everything's subject to change, so I don't like saying that until I actually see it in the game. Equipment on buffers are way less important, except if they have a certain energy rating requirement. The aforementioned Verena here would be a good example, however, I will cover that in my Verena guide soon. You can switch your equipment in between stages and the Tower of Adversity. As an example, if you have the String Master Rectifier fully built for Yin Lin and that's your only Rectifier, and use her in the first floor, you can equip this weapon to another character, for example, Encore for the second floor. This will help you save on a few resources when building multiple teams. That being said... So what that means is if you have an equipment set for one character and you use that inside of one of the main endgame modes, in between stages you can swap those to other characters. That way you don't have to build multiple sets in case, that your, in case your equipment grinding isn't going too well. It's a very good quality of life feature that will uh, kind of prevent players from wailing or feeling uh, missed, like, like they're missing out. It's very, very, very good. I really hope this video has been helpful and if it was, please leave a like, comment and subscribe. These kinds of videos take a long time. That was a really good fucking video. And I'm really glad that this dude's in the community. Very clean, very to the point. I think he was a little bit vague with his terminology, but I think that's okay because I can break that shit down. Because it, it is very difficult because when you immerse yourself in the content creating world, when you immerse yourself in guide making and theory crafting, the acronyms and the way that you speak and the people who you talk to are also going to be using those acronyms. But 
most people know what you're saying. They don't know why you're saying it. And sometimes they don't know what it is that you are saying for certain terms. So that's why I do feel like layman content creators are very layman, meaning like breaking down terminology to where everybody can understand it, no matter their intellect level. That's where I really shined as a content creator was my ability to make people understand complex concepts very easily. And that's what I recommend every theory crafter and guide maker really think about when they're making a guide is how can I make people who need a guide, AKA the dum dums, understand what I'm saying because hardcore players don't need hardcore guides because they already get it right so you got to make the dum-dums get what it is that you're saying and that's very important I do want to go even further because I want to I want to watch this guy even more and I think watching an echo system would help quite a bit as for most gacha games equipment is an integral part of character progression and what there by the way I do want to say in case this is a YouTube video Please go to I Am Rivenous and go give him a like and subscribe on all of his videos. Okay, I'm going to link his shit, but having people like this is very important to a community. Okay, very important. Ring Waves is no different. So, let's talk about the ecosystem. How it works, the good and the bad, and how to efficiently spend your resources so that you don't run into problems later into the game. Short disclaimer, good. as this video is based on the CBT2, it may change into the future. I will pin a comment if that is the case. That being said, let's get the first and most important thing out of the way. The ecosystem in itself is not stamina gated, and that is huge. Okay. It's a positive and a negative. Okay. So the ecosystem, in case you don't know, is pretty much the relic grinding system in Honkai Star Run Wuthering Waves. Okay. Now, there's pros and cons. If you're casual, it really doesn't affect you. You farm when you want to farm. You do what you want to do. Acceleration, great. But if you're hardcore, this essentially means that you can play forever. It essentially means that you can play forever. You can go to other people's worlds. You can grind their worlds, get all their echoes. And that's going to take a lot of time. And that's going to take a lot of effort. And it's going to be a pain in the ass. But for players who want to play all the time, it's great. But for players who feel like they're going to feel like they're missing out if they don't play nonstop, well, it could be a detractor of their enjoyment of the game. It's a controversial take for sure. But I I'm not going to do that. I'm going to play when I get on, and then I'm done after that. You obtain echoes by defeating enemies in the overworld, granting a percent chance to drop the defeated enemy's echo. This chance is dependent on the terminal level of your data bank and increases from 10% at level 1 to 20% at level 10. However, the terminal level also determines the max rank, or in other words, rarity, at which you can find echoes. More about that later on. Each echo comes... So I'm not sure if you caught that, right? 10% at level 1 to 20% at level 10. This means getting to level 10 is going to be very important for maximizing your grinding efficiency on your account. However, the terminal level also determines the max rank, or in other words, rarity, at which you can find echoes. Yeah. More about that later on. Each echo comes with their own unique echo ability. This ability is unique to the echo itself and does not change. That means this snip snap will always throw fireballs and with ref will always deal arrow AoE. However, echoes do come with different attributes. Is terminal level the same as AR and Genshin? Yeah, it's very similar. The attribute determines their Sonata effect. So don't spend resin until level 10? No, I wouldn't say that. Because this the, the people with Genshin and Honkai always say, well, well then don't, don't farm anything until you get to these levels. No, you still can, right? Because you're going to need materials to level these things up. And also, if it increases your enjoyment of the game, it'll also help you get to those levels faster. So you can do however it is you want. Never feel like you fucked up if you used, like, quote-unquote resin before uh, level 10 and hence the set bonus. Furthermore, every echo has two main stats, whereas the first stat is yeah, random, recycle, and the yeah. second stat will always be either flat HP or attack, depending on the echo itself. For example, a horde always will always have flat HP as secondary main stat. So, let's look at my fusion dread main miners. Two of my dreadman miners have the fusion sonata effect, and one has the healing bonus. Yep. The latter also features double HP as main stat, whereas the other two have attack percent and defense percent as primary main stat respectively. Each echo can be leveled up, unlocking a new convenient tuning slot every 5th level. However, this does not apply to rank 2 echoes. Rank 2 echoes cannot be tuned and cap out at level 10. Echoes of rank 3 and above can be tuned and will gain a random substat when done so. Ra this is your hell. Farming random substats, this will be your fucking hell. You're going to die here, you are going to eat pig shit here. This is where hopes and dreams come to die. This is what you're going to take to the Reddits and Twitch streamers chats to shit on them and laugh whenever they get a bad roll and essentially try to make them fucking miserable. Rank 5 Echoes kept out at level 25 and can have up to 5 substats. These are random and fixed once rolled. What you see is what you get. 
This means you can have really crappy substats, such as my crownless here, featuring an impressive 70 flat attack and 40 flat defense. Or you can have god rolls and get something like my inferno rider. You won't get that. On the other hand, there's no RNG regarding upgrade rolls. Only your main stats can be upgraded. Every resonator, as the characters in this game are called, can equip a maximum of 5 echoes, whereas the first and topmost slot will determine the echo ability. This so I just want to address that real quick. For anybody who thought that this means you get guaranteed stat rolls by his wording. The same way that a main set increases in games like Genshin Impact and Honkai Star Rail uh, is going to hold true for this game. If you level an artifact up, the main set's going to go up. But when you're unlocking substats, uh, and this was fixed, there used to be... I'm going to bring this up. So Echoes, there used to be high, high rolls, mid, high rolls, low, high rolls, high, mid rolls, mid, mid rolls, low, mid rolls, high, low rolls, mid, low rolls, and low, low rolls. And what this would be, let's just say, for example, uh, there was crit chance, right? So let's just think of a random number just to make it make sense. Crit could either be anywhere between 3% and 13%. That was insane. But now it's been squished a lot more. I'm not sure the exact number. Let's say now it's more like 5 to 8%. Right. So they really, 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 really fixed uh, how the rolling of Echoes is going to work. Right. That shit was going to be fucking miserable. But thank God they fixed it. This means you can equip one Echo ability per character. Whereas the other four slots will grant you stats and set bonuses. Set bonuses come in two and five pieces. This allows you to have a certain freedom, such as equipping a really good echo ability and still being able to gain two two-piece bonuses from the other four slots, basically allowing you to have one flex slot. However, and this is only my thoughts on how it may turn out when the game is released and we have theory crafted everything, getting a five-piece set with good substat rolls will be very difficult and time-consuming. Next, echo- I want to explain to you why that's a great thing. So, nothing- okay, so I want, I want to tell you this. If you've seen a movie and you've known how it ends, you're going to be a lot less likely to rewatch that movie unless it was like absolutely groundbreaking incredible. But generally people will watch movies and they move on. When you play a gacha game, if you get everything you want, you're going to walk away. It's very important that the main grind is exactly that, a fucking grind that can be done in perpetuity where always upgrades can happen. But it's also important that those upgrades that can happen aren't required. What's important is you can beat everything with an 80 crit uh, rate, 200 crit damage main and substats, or like substats, but you could get a 100 crit rate and 500% crit damage. Because then it's cool because your account will feel different, but you don't need that. So people who villainize how long it takes to get a perfect set are stupid because you don't want players to ever get there because the game is going to feel a lot less fun when you have that 100% completion on your game. You're going to quit right after. Those also come with a cost, or load more specifically. Depending on your databank level, your maximum load will be in between 8 and 12. The total sum of all equipped Echo's costs cannot exceed your load limit. This means bringing a higher cost and hence stronger Echo will limit your building possibilities further down the line for that character. Furthermore, Echoes come in different ranks or rare. But can you do the same with four-star characters? So the crazy thing that can be a positive or a negative for Wuthering Waves is that the four stars and five star five bleh, the four stars and five stars feel barely different in this game. And that's kind of a problem. Because some people want to feel OP the moment they get a five star, but some people really want the four stars to feel balanced so you can use what you want to use. The difference between four stars and five stars in this game are very, very, very minimal. And we'll watch a video about that right after. Uh, so yes, you can still crush all the content with 4-star characters. The rank determines the base stats of the Echo. I personally think it's a great thing. A good example for that would be my Saber Boar, which I have two of. One rank 2 and one rank... It's going to make the game feel a lot more free-to-play friendly. However, it's going to it's gonna affect the overall um, currency that the company brings in. 3. While they have the same main stats, the stats of the rank 3 boar are higher. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the good and the bad. The good is obvious. You are not stamina gated, farming for good echoes. Yep. However, you are limited by the amount of enemies the entire map has each day, as yep. well as respawn timer for bosses. For the bad side, leveling your echoes still costs you echo development materials, which in turn are indeed stamina gated. This also means that you probably want to level any echo to level 5 and set a tuning first before getting it all the way to max level. 
if the first tuning rolls into shitty stats, you at least have preserved some XP materials. Just to make sure everybody understands, that means you can farm Echoes infinitely, but that doesn't mean that you can upgrade Echoes infinitely. Furthermore, at least as of now, there are only 9 Sonata Resonance types in the game. One for boosting each element, one for healing, one for attack, and one for energy regeneration. This limits set building quite a bit, as you probably just want to get the elemental damage percent for DPS characters and maybe fill it up with a more generic attack percent or energy regen and get heal percent for healers. However, this can easily be- Put the lightning set on the lightning guy. Put the healing set on the healing guy. It really ain't that deep. ...fixed by new Sonata set bonuses in the future. So, at least as of now, I would not worry about this too much. Yet. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Now, once again, the other negative that I would say is this could lead players to feel left out if they don't grind 24-7, but you really don't. But the nice thing is you at least have the option to. I will not be doing that, but it'll give a lot of players content they want for hardcore grinders, and I think that's nice. I think that's kind of like the, the status quo for Wuthering Waves. There's a lot of casual content, but if you do want hardcore content, you can get it. And uh, it just makes me happy this game has a little bit uh, for everything. Um, once again, I am Riminous. Great fucking video. I'm going to link your channel again. Great guide maker. Amazing fucking guides. And uh, yeah, I want to watch one more. I want to watch one more. Because this shit is good. It makes me feel like I'm prepared, over prepared to be honest. Because you can just boot this shit up and play. I want to keep going. Regardless if you are a casual or a hardcore player, if you play for 2 hours or 10 hours a day, when Withering Waves finally releases, we all want to get most of the pools available to get our favorite characters, and obviously also have the best start we can. So let's talk about how you can optimize your early game, which mistakes to avoid and how to get the best start possible, at least okay. mathematically speaking. Uh, I think things that you really need to understand for early game priority is just to understand who you want out of your free five-star selector. If you want the game to be very, very, very easy, pick Verena. And then if you want to play who you want, then get this. Pick who you want. I'll be picking Calcharo 100%. Usual oh, and also pre-download the game on May 19th. Disclaimer, the link to the sheet is in the description and all this video's info is based on the CBT2, hence subject to change. And that's it, let's start and talk about what we will cover in this video. First, we will briefly touch on what you should prioritize early into the game, followed by an in-depth analysis on all the things we've touched on before. So basically, part one is the what you should do part, and part two is the reason why. I Great. usually like to have a foundation for my claims Good. as much as I can, Amazing. but if you don't care about that, you can- Talking at people is the fucking worst. Say what your claim is and why you said it's all great. And stop watching great mentality. the first part, honestly. However, if you do, please still leave me a like and a comment. That's also a great thing. Stop believing information where the explainer doesn't explain why they said it. So if someone says, this is how it is, and this is why it is how it is, great. But if they just say, this is how it is, I would, I would just wait until you hear an explanation. Otherwise, what's the point? Comment, because that's how the YouTube algorithm works. Thanks. Why do you say that? Because, okay, so if I were to tell you, don't walk on that tile of floor, okay? Don't walk on that tile of floor, because if you step on it, you will die. You will die because there is a bomb underneath that tile versus a just don't step on that tile. It kind of makes a really bad relationship where, and it's okay every now and then, but if your entire relationship is take something that this person says with no foundation whatsoever or no track record, this is mainly just for new information. Obviously, there's credible sources where if they've been right 99 times before, they're probably right now. But for new information from new people that you don't trust, never take their claims at face value until they've been up, uh, built up a track record, right? It's just, it's a bad habit to get into. First up are the priorities. As usual, I will make this guide with free-to-play in mind, and I want to emphasize that enjoying a game- And that's great, because you don't need to make guides for whales, because whales are just gonna fucking win. ...is far more important than chasing numbers. So even if this guide, or any guide for that matter, would, just in theory, tell you to skip all of the story to be the most efficient, don't just do that. First and foremost, enjoy the game. That said, you can start farming echoes early on into the game. I also highly recommend you to do so, if not to say this is probably by far the most important thing to do. Literally nothing matters as much as getting your data bank level raised as early as possible. 
since a higher databank level will also allow you to find and collect higher level echoes. This becomes especially important if you are limited in your time and don't have multiple friends to farm multiple worlds. Uh, this was the exact same system in Genshin Impact. Yeah, uh, raising your world level is very important. This is a very similar system to Genshin. Raise world higher equates to better drops quicker. It's very simple and a slight increase in difficulty. Speaking of set echoes, you will only receive a limited number of tuners. While the initial amount you receive seems a lot, I promise you, you will burn through them very fast. Gacha game systems have a habit of overloading you with very important resources very quickly at the beginning in hopes that you will overspend, which will generally lead you to an in-game purchase down the line because you did not realize how vital your resources are. I highly recommend before anybody uses their resources to just be a little bit careful and only use resources as necessary because gacha games are very predatory in that fact where they are trying to get you to make a purchase, intentional or unintentional, who's to say? So what are tuners? Tuners are necessary to unlock the Echo substats. Right, so every Echo has a main stat, whether that's crit damage, you know, specific damage, attack, HP, defense, energy regen, who fucking knows. The substats are the four bonus stats. We've seen the same thing in Hawkeye Star on uh, Genshin Impact. Uh, they're highly randomized stats that can give you additional stats of your main stat or... Because this, I want to let you guys know, in, in Wuthering Waves, you can get crit rate as a main value and then you can get crit rate as a sub as well. Right, so you can double up. To my knowledge... Unless they change that. That is how it is right now. They might change it later. We will see. Right? But those are the four very randomized stats underneath the main stat. If you have ever played Genshin or Honkai Star Rail, just imagine your substats don't unlock automatically when reaching a certain level on your artifact or relic. And you also need another item to roll for those, and you don't even know which substats you get until you have done so. That's literally what tuners are. Now, for those who did not play Genshin or HSR, Using Echo Experience items, you can level your, well, Echoes. Rank 2 Echoes are limited to level 10, those are the green ones. Rank 3 to level 15, blue. Rank 4 to level 20, purple. And only rank 5 Echoes, you know, the golden ones, can reach level 25. Since you unlock a new substat slot every 5 levels, that means only rank 5 Echoes. You know, again, these golden colored ones have their maximum potential. Because, well, they can have five substats, whereas rank 3, for example, can only have three substats. There are tuners for rank 3 echoes, rank 4 echoes, and rank 5 echoes. The good news is, at least in the CBT2, there was no way to combine lower level tuners into higher level ones. I would like to put a disclaimer for anybody watching this. Uh, there is also an echo event currently happening on Wuthering Waves. I will say Echoes right now are going to be very difficult to get a 5-star one, but later down the line, they're going to be much easier. But if you do want a good head start, I recommend everybody do the pre-registration Echo event. This at least means you can use the lower level ones on your rank 3 and 4. And if you need a guide on how to do that Echo system pre-register properly, uh, feel free to go check out Lol Shinya's video. He made a great video on it, uh, which I'm hoping... Um, you, Shinya, can you link that? Can you link that? Thank you, Shinya. Or echoes without having to worry about losing out on rank 5 tuners later into the game. The bad news is, every resource you put into those echoes will be useless when you unlock rank 5 echoes, and only 75% will be refunded to you when using them as fodder. The second bad news is a feature which was not present in the CBT2. While we don't know the details yet officially, they have announced that there will be a possibility to reuse unenhanced echoes and convert them into new ones. I repeat, unenhanced echoes. But unenhanced means neither leveled nor tuned. This is very important because you can use all your farmed rank 2, 3 and 4 echoes to fish for good rank 5 echoes later into the game. So the way that I'm going to play this is I'm going to find echoes with the proper main stat then I'm going to max those. Okay, I'm eventually going to tune them all to where I have all the subsets unlocked. Right From that point, once I have a good basis of echoes that I need to use, I'm then going to be very careful and only level up the ones with the proper main stat that I use and then unlock one slot at a time. And then once I've hit my best case scenario for whatever the first main stat goes, then I'll upgrade the rest. And then I'm going to slowly work that bit down where I level it up, get the right stat, then go for the next one until all of my characters have universally the best main stat and, the, and, the, and as many best substats as possible down below. So this section here has been a bit long. This will so be a process, for sure. My point here being, only level 5 Echoes for each member of your team, yep. so 15 in total. 
Refrain from leveling rank 2 echoes. You will gain rank 3 echoes once very early into the game. Yep. With data bank level 4 to be exact, which you can reach within like the first hour of the game. And even on those, I would refrain from leveling them too much. Yep. Instead, use all the other echoes you farm to recycle them later into rank 5 echoes instead. So you can try to fish for some early good substats. If you need some echoes to bridge the gap in between, leveling and tuning some rank 4 echoes is certainly the way to go. Next up is the main story. Well, my sort biggest, of. My biggest suggestion for anybody who's stuck because their gear isn't good enough in Wuthering Waves, number one tip, just get better at the game. And if you do that, you won't need to level anything else up. It's great. Unlock world bosses based on your progress in the story, and they can only be farmed once a week. This means you want to have unlocked the world boss at least within the first week of launch. Hence, the sort of, it's like not really a day one or two priority, but within the first week. No, it's certainly important. Another big mistake you could make is not farming the ores and other materials in the overworld. Some of the crafted 4-star weapons are actually quite good early on, and you need a lot of materials to be able to craft them. And they will provide you with easy access to a guaranteed early rank 5 4-star. You know, those are in my opinion the most important things you certainly should take care about if you care about efficiency. So let's get to the reasoning. This part will be a little bit spreadsheet heavy as usual, so bear with me. We will start with the if you ever see anybody link a spreadsheet, just ignore it. I will do my best to translate this into something that people give a fuck about. Echoes and data bank. Our goal should be to reach terminal level 15 as soon as possible. For that, we need 2100 Jesus experience. Jesus Christ. You gain experience whenever you obtain a new echo of a new rank you have not yet well obtained. You gain 10 experience for each unique rank 2 and rank 3 echo, 15 experience for unique rank 4 echoes, and 20 experience for each rank 5 echo. Since we cannot reasonably obtain rank 5 echoes until terminal level 15, which is where we want to get to, our average XP earned during this journey is 13. I'm gonna not stop playing until I hit terminal rank 15 on day one. I will be terminal rank one before I end the stream, or terminal rank 15 before I end the stream. I'm gonna just beat it. Per echo. But you also start off the game with a 10% drop rate for an echo, going to 15% at level 4 and 20% at level 10. So, originally, I planned to include some math here to show you how many days exactly you would need to get to data bank level 15. Unfortunately, that did not work out. I have absolutely no way to calculate anything even remotely close to being correct. From personal experience, you can easily get data bank level 10 or 12 even within the first day, but my math says otherwise. It says it shouldn't be possible, but I know that it is, because I did so, and many others did so during the CBT too. And my math is off, so I cannot show this. So I have to leave you here with just my personal experience and estimation. Given you play solo and clear the entire map every day, you should reach data bank level 15 after 3 to 5 days. If you have. Nah, I'm gonna get it in day one, be easy. Friends, you can make this faster as you can farm in their world as well. So, there are a few things we still have to take care of. First up, do you remember when I said since we cannot reasonably obtain rank 5 echoes until terminal level 15? That is not entirely true. There are three level 20 red enemies in the world, which are basically just really strong versions. You know, they look like this. You will notice them, trust me and they will guarantee to drop the R5 Echo when defeated, regardless of your terminal level. Furthermore, you also might get a guaranteed R5 from the current web event if you have played it. So these are just a very few examples, but you are able to obtain higher rank Echoes early on, disregarding your terminal level, which in turn will grant you more experience. Secondly, and more importantly, your databank level is restricted by your current world level. To unlock databank level 15, you first need to be in Soul Phase 3 or Union level 30, which also means we heavily have to prioritize gaining Union experience. I will briefly touch on that later. Lastly, well... I Great, because I got no idea what the fuck that is. I'm glad he said that, because I got no idea what the fuck that is. Unfortunately, a day only has 24 hours, and I honestly beg to differ, you are actually able... Oh, you know your account level. Oh, okay, great. ...to defeat every single enemy in the entire world in the first days, while also trying to reasonably level your union level. Speaking of union level, let's keep this part short. You are able to get to union level 30 within a few days, if you ref- I can't help but look at the background video of what's being played and watching him struggle to blow up a wall and think that his chat would be spamming anything other than arm retard wahaha. Fresh the first days. That is much faster. For exact values, please have a look into the link cheat in the corresponding tab. Again, it is re- Also, this is subject to change, but uh, <laughs> there's no way they change this. There's also daily quests that are going to be given to you that's going to help accelerate the progress of your account very quickly. So before you think that you're going to have to play all day every day for 24 hours, you're not going to have to do that because if you just play whenever the daily resets, you're going to get big boost to your account level. So for hardcore players, they can just grind through everything. But for casual players, just logging in once a day and playing for a little bit, you'll still get that massive boost and you'll get there in no time. Really, really hard, if not even impossible, to math out, currently at least, how long you actually need to get to data bank level 15. Yep. Simply because there are so many variables. 
In the end, from personal experience, it will take a few days, depending on how much you play. I also highly recommend you to use the tracking feature inside your databank to find echoes you do not have yet. So that was quite long, so let's go over to the other points, the main story. Oh, well, actually, I think I already said everything about this, because honestly, there isn't much to add or to prove. I mean, you have to unlock the boss by doing the main story. So let's just skip this one and go straight to the next point. Do you remember when I said, which also means we heavily have to prioritize gaining union experience? Yes? Good. So, technically speaking, clearing all content and doing all your daily stuff every day of the first month should bring you to union level 42. If you max refresh every day, you can do so much faster and will reach union level 49 within the same time. But it will also cost your asteroid worth around $300. Refreshing just once a day will bring you around 8% ahead of someone who doesn't refresh and costs you around $18.56 a month. For an important note here, I think the actual refresh prices are a bit more expensive. The so what this is saying is, it's really not worth to spend money on this game unless you have a lot of money. The one for a single refresh a day is correct though. So basically what this tells you is, if you ain't a whale, don't refresh. You can easily hit Union level 30 in a few days. Yes, if you want to whale and grind, go for it. But if you're going to be, a, don't, there's no point in being a light spender if you want accelerated progress for your account level, okay? So unless you plan on dropping big money, just don't waste it and save your fucking money, which is great for us. It's not that great for the company. This is a free to play. Last but not least, let's talk about the farming part. There are approximately 300 ores for you to farm every day, so if you want to craft any R5 weapon, you better get to work rather sooner than later. I also expanded the rover calculation sheet for the craftable sword, so here are the results. And while not necessarily great, given this is the only non gacha sword you have access to, it is better than the alternative. Un I don't want to stress anybody out, you don't need all this shit, okay? Regardless, Riven's great video. Okay, great video. Here are the main takeaways. Watch some guide makers if you're overly stressed, if you're casual, you're fine. Uh, unless you're going to spend a million dollars, then don't spend any money on trying to progress your account. Only do that if you want to and understand you will get minimal increase, which is great for free to play. And it's also really good for low spenders as well, because that means that the, the odds of this game becoming incredibly predatory is very, very, very small. A lot of great tips in here. Very excited. And if you need to have any more advice, feel free to come to my stream at twitch.tv for slash techtone. But please check out I Am Rivenous. Check out as many theory crowders and guide makers as you can. They help the game very much. And check out as much content as you can for Wuthering Waves. And most importantly, tweet out Wuthering Waves on Twitter. Love you guys. Thank you for watching. Great fucking video. Support smaller creators. We need smaller creators who survive. Go find a smaller creator in Wuthering Waves today. And go fucking subscribe. See y'all there. Peace.